Hi, this is Pat Love with Pat's Two Cents, and we are reading from Joshua chapter 7, starting at verse 1. And Pat's Two Cents will interject here and there. You know how that goes. Okay. But the children of Israel committed a trespass in the accursed thing. For Achan, the son of Carmi, the son of Zabdi, the son of Zerah, of the tribe of Judah, took of the accursed thing. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against the children of Israel. Now, I'm stopping there for a second with Pat's two cents. When the people of God co-mingle sin with righteousness, when we allow things and we uh, are complacent about how we try to live for the Lord, and we dabble maybe a dabble in a little tarot card reading or psychic hotlines, or we dabble in a little smooching and kissing and touching and feely stuff on the couch, working its way into the bedroom. <clears throat> or we go all the way to the bedroom and do everything we could do in there. Okay. Or we have nasty attitudes and we're backbiting each other and gossiping and, and slandering each other's name, whatever the case may be, or we're bent on unforgiveness, spite, and revenge. Whatever your sin, your little pet sin is, the bottom line is it waters down your power. It waters down what you do for the Lord. It almost null and voids your anointing because God will not co-mingle with sin. He will not cohabit with our sins. So one has to give either the sin or God. All right, let me keep reading. And Joshua sent men from Jericho to Ai, which is beside Bethaven, on the east side of Bethel, and spake unto them, saying, Go up and view the country, and the men went up and viewed Ai. And they returned to Joshua and said unto him, Let not all the people go up, but let about two or three thousand men go up and smite Ai. And make not all the people to labor thither, for they are but a few. So there went up thither of the people about three thousand men. And they fled. Listen. So there went up thither of the people about 3,000 men. This is the trip. And they fled before the men of Ai. The men of Ai sent them running. Wow. Okay. Verse 5. And the men of Ai smote of them about 30 and 6 men. For they chased them from before the gate, even unto Sebera, and smote them in the going down. Wherefore the hearts of the people melted and became as water. And Joshua ripped his clothes. That means he tore his clothes and fell to the earth upon his face before the ark of the Lord until the eventide. He and the elders of Israel and put dust upon their heads. And Joshua said, Alas, O Lord God, Wherefore hast thou at all brought this people over Jordan to deliver us into the hands of the Amorites to destroy us? Would to God we had been content and dwelt on the other side of Jordan. Oh Lord, what shall I say when Israel turned their backs before their enemies? For the Canaanites and all the inhabitants of the land shall hear of it and shall environ us about and cut, uh, cut off our name from the earth. And what will thou do unto thy great name? Oh boy, he's he copping a plea big time, ain't he? <laughs> well, listen. <laughs> and the Lord said unto Joshua, get thee up. Wherefore liest thou thus upon thy face? Israel has sinned, and they have also transgressed my covenant which I commanded them. For they have even taken of the accursed thing, 
and have also stolen and dissembled also, and they have put it even among their own stuff. Therefore, the children of Israel could not stand before their enemies, but turned their backs before their enemies because they were accursed. Neither will I be with you anymore, except ye destroy the accursed from among you. Pat's two cents. Got to stop right there, y'all. Listen, listen, listen. A lot of stuff that goes on in our lives, we either want to blame God for, or we want to blame the devil. It's a demonic attack. Some of y'all got family members dabbling in stuff they have no business dabbling in, and they're not telling you but they're doing it secretly. But it affects the whole family, the whole household. It affects the body of Christ. That's why the body of Christ has so little power. It's not because God doesn't do miracles anymore. It's because we have become very complacent, relaxed, and uh, we've been very casual with the sins that we've allowed in our lives. And with sin comes curses. Hmm. With curses come problems. With problems come crisis. Yes. And it gets worse. So let's go back to where we started, allowing sinful things into our lives. Some of you have family members that bring things in the house. You don't even know it. You have kids that watch stuff. You don't even know it and is definitely demonic. Or you have husbands or wives that are out there dabbling in stuff or dabbling in people in things they shouldn't be touching. Uh-huh. And you don't know anything about it. Or they have a gambling habit and you don't know anything about that. Whatever it is, whatever their little pet sin is, it will affect your whole household. It will. There's no going around it. There's no avoiding it. Whatever sin is played with, sin doesn't play. We play with sin, but sin doesn't play with us. Sin kicks us in the teeth. After talking us into the sin, then sin just boomerangs and blows up in our face. And we wonder, ah! What happened, Lord? How could you do this to me? Aren't I your servant? Aren't I your child, your daughter, your son? Aren't I part of the body of Christ? Well, now you better rethink that. Hmm. Because you've been doing stuff and you haven't been asking God to forgive you. If you haven't been asking God to forgive you and you haven't been trying not to, and God knows whether you're really trying or whether you try for 10 seconds and say, ah, what the hell? Might as well. Hmm. Yeah. What is your attitude? See, one of the things that we have in this day and age where we fall short, there are too many people who do not fear God. They don't fear God consequences. There's a whole lot that goes into that, which I don't have time to cover, but I will cover one little segment. When they decided to rule out corporal punishment, which means spank, spank. Hmm? Yeah, on the little hiney back there. Kids grew up thinking they did not have to pay penalties for their actions. They grew up thinking life had no consequences so they could do whatever they wanted to, do whatever came to their mind. And nobody could do anything about it. Not really now. So since they weren't getting the spank spank and that little time out in the corner, you know, parents thought that was really going to work. Anyway, moving right along, I'm not even going to go there. And parents don't punish their kids and say, you know, you're off the internet for a month. You don't get to hang out with your friends for two weeks. 
No, no, you're going to stay in the house and clean up every day. I got stuff for you to do. You're going to be sorry you did what you did. Well, since there are no penalties in the house and parents want to be friends and buddies rather than parents and disciplinarians and teachers, what you end up with is weeds growing up. They're growing up in any crazy direction. And as they grow up learning not to fear their parents, not to fear authority, they also transfer that to God. And they don't fear God. They don't take him seriously. They think they can slide because they've slidden throughout their childhood. Hmm. Think about that. So they dabble over here, dabble over there. Hey, baby, let's go have some fun. Mm -hmm. Have no cares in the world. Hmm. Okay. And then when the nitty gritty starts to hit the fan in their life. Oh, how could that have happened? No, not me. Hmm. Well. Got to pay the cost to be the boss, baby. And if you want to be the boss in sin, you got to pay the cost of sin. That's it. Moving right along, back to God's word. <clears throat> now, verse 12. Therefore, the children of Israel could not stand before their enemies but turned their backs before their enemies because they were accursed. Neither will I be with you anymore except ye destroy the accursed from among you. Up, sanctify the people and say, sanctify yourselves against tomorrow. For thus saith the Lord God of Israel, there is an accursed thing in the midst of thee. O Israel, thou canst, that means you can't, you cannot, thou canst not stand before thine enemies until ye take away the accursed thing from among you. So if you are having issues with weakness, if you're fighting fear, this is Pat's two cents talking now, if you're fighting fear, if things are starting to unravel, in your life and people are coming against you. Sometimes it's because you are in Christ all the way. Sometimes it's because you are allowing too much looseness in your life. Some of you on YouTube, who knows what you do in the middle of the night on the internet? Hmm. Some of you men wear your hands out playing with stuff that you shouldn't be playing with, looking at stuff you shouldn't be looking at. Jesus said, if you just look at a woman to lust after her, to you, it is sin. It's a sexual sin. You've already committed that sin in your mind. Now, for those of you who are on the gay side, that goes for you who look at the same sex too. Doesn't matter what you're looking at. And for those of you who are pedophiles, if you look at a child to lust after them, you have already committed the sin. So if you wonder why the body of Christ has so little power, has so little authority, has so little effectiveness, look at how much sin we allow in our lives. It speaks for itself. It's self-explanatory. Okay, moving right along to verse 14. In the morning, therefore, ye shall be brought according to your tribes. And it shall be that the tribe which the Lord taketh shall come according to the families thereof. And the family which the Lord shall take shall come by households. And the household which the Lord shall take shall come man by man. And it shall be that he that is taken with the accursed thing shall be burnt with fire. I got to stop there for a second, y'all. There's a comma, so leave a little room for Pat's two cents. Listen, <laughs> some of your behinds will be in the frying pan if you don't stop what you're doing. With, you, know, you know what you're doing. Yeah. All right, uh, moving right along. He and all that he had, 
because he has transgressed the covenant of the Lord and because he hath wrought folly in Israel. So Joshua rose up early in the morning and brought Israel by their tribes and the tribe of Judah was taken. And he brought the family of Judah and he took the family of the Zarhites. Oh, wait, I, let, let, let me stop here. Let me stop. I'll read that again. Listen, the Lord just brought something to my mind. Last week, it was a real hot day. I think it was a Tuesday or a Thursday. It was real hot, hot, unnormal. It was the hottest day of this month. And I wanted to go swimming. And I was thinking about a man I had met around the pool last year. This brother was tall, dark, and fine. And Mama Sita may have gray hair up here in the attic, but there's still fire in the fireplace. So I ain't dead. My motive was not that I really wanted to swim. I was feeling this thing all over me like, don't you want some attention? Don't you want to interact with some people? And I was getting ready to get myself all cute. And I said, you know what? This ain't the right reason. Stay hot, stay in the house, stay clear of all temptation. Don't even go there mentally, emotionally, figuratively, or physically. Don't go there. Stay away. This is not a good day, a good night, a good afternoon. This is not the time to go to the pool, and I'm not the one to do the going. Because I'm not going out of a pure conscience. So I had to watch myself. I had to guard my heart. I had to assess my motive. I had to check myself. And no, I did not go. And I was so glad because the next couple of days when I did go, my motive was clean. And when I went, I had a ball. And nobody was there but me and another little old lady who left after 30 minutes. I had the whole pool to myself. We have to check our motives. Why? Are we taking on some of these harmless activities? Why? When the motive is not right, sit your butt down and avoid. Avoid at all costs. Now. So this is what I want you to think about. Always check your motive. Check your activities. Watch yourself. Make sure whatever you're getting ready to do, it's out of the right conscience. It's out of the right motive. That's what I mean to say. Now, let's move on because this is loaded. This chapter is loaded here. Okay. Um, God calls the family out for the sake of time. And he, he points out Achan. Let's get to that. Verse 20. Verse 19. And Joshua said unto Achan, My son, give, I pray thee, glory to the Lord God of Israel, and make confession unto him. And tell me now what thou hast done. Hide it not from me. And Achan answered Joshua and said, Indeed, I have sinned against the Lord of Israel, and thus and thus have I done. Now, oh my goodness, this is hitting me too. Some of y'all think I'm sorry is all you need to say. And you can keep on, keep on trucking, baby. I got to keep on trucking. Because all I said was I'm sorry. So that gives me a free pass. It didn't give him a free pass. He confessed. Mm. This is where we this is where we must learn to fear God. Not in a way like an abusive parent, because God loves us. But God knows our hearts better than we do. He knows when we're really trying 
and when we're really just sliding, getting by. Okay, now, and Achan answered Joshua and said, Indeed, I have sinned against the Lord God of Israel, and thus and thus have I done. He confessed it. He was honest. When I saw among the spoils a goodly Babylonian garment and 200 shekels of silver and a wedge of gold of 50 shekels weight, then I coveted them and took them. And behold, they are hid in the earth in the midst of my tent and the silver under it. So Joshua sent messengers and they ran into the tent and behold, it was hid in his tent and the silver under it. And they took them out of the midst of the tent and brought them unto Joshua and unto all the children of Israel and laid them out before the Lord. And Joshua and all Israel with him took Achan, the son of Zerah, check this out, and the silver and the garment and the wedge of gold, check it out, and his sons, and his daughters, and his oxen, and his asses, and his sheep, and his tent, and all that he had. And they brought them into the valley of Acre. And Joshua said, Why hast thou troubled us? The Lord shall trouble thee this day. And all Israel stoned him with stones, and burned them with fire after they had stoned them with stones. And they raised over him a great heap of stones unto this day. So the Lord turned from the fierceness of his anger. Wherefore the name of that place was called the Valley of Acre unto this day. Now, listen, you guys. Whoa, 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 whoa. I got to go on to, uh, a, uh, a, to Joshua chapter Eight, because I want you to hear the result of getting rid of sin. See, keeping sin, playing with sin, roommating with sin, tinkering with sin, toying with sin, dabbling in sin. A little here, a little there, and then a whole lot of God, and a little here, and a little there, and a whole lot of God. Well, listen to this. This is what God did as a result of them driving out the sin completely from the nation of Israel, which is a symbol of us driving the sins out of our lives personally. And the Lord said unto Joshua, Fear not, neither be thou dismayed. Take all the people of war with thee and arise. Go up to Ai, the same place that drove them out, and they were defeated horribly, and 36 men died. God told him, now go back in, go back in, fear not. And he said, arise, go up to Ai, see, I have given unto thy hand the king of Ai and his people and his city and his land. And thou shalt do to Ai and her king as thou didst unto Jericho and her king. Only the spoil thereof and the cattle thereof shall ye take for prey unto yourself. Lay thee in ambush for the city behind it. All right. So Joshua arose and all the people of war to go up against the eye. And Joshua chose out 30,000 mighty men of valor and sent them away by night. And he commanded them saying, behold, ye shall lay in wait against the city, even behind the city and not go very far from the city. But be ye all ready, be ready, be ready. That's a key term for all of us. We must always be ready. You never know when God's going to use us. Be instant in season and out of season. All right. Now, now, I'm not going to go through the whole thing that he tells him to do. But I want to get to the punchline of chapter 8. Because they drove out the sin. They cleanse themselves of all the rudiments of the sin. This is what God did for them.
And so it was, verse 25, that all that fell that day, both men and women with 12,000, even all the men of Ai. For Joshua drew not his hand back, wherewith he stretched out the spear until he had utterly destroyed all the inhabitants of Ai. All right. So the bottom line is, hmm, they got the victory. Do you want the victory in your life? Do you want to win every battle? Hmm? Do you want to win it? You want to ultimately win the war? Well, you've got to start battling sin like your life depends on it because it does. You can't tinker with it. See, the body of Christ, these different churches, you get the minister screwing around with the women and he's got a wife and kids sitting right there. You got the, 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 the uh, female pastor screwing around with the men. I mean, it, it gets crazy or you get men screwing around with boys and women screwing around with girls and all kind of craziness going on in these churches. You got men stealing the money, playing, toying with the money, borrowing it, not paying it back. You got all kinds of, of things where people are not accountable for their actions. They're not honest. They're not living a clean, holy life. They have allowed the accursed things of sin to ease into their existence, into their realm of influence. I mean, their sphere of influence. And because they have allowed sin to take up residence and they... They allow visitations. They may not allow sin to live in their life, but they allow visitation. They have given sin visitation rights. So when sin comes knocking on the door and they're feeling tired and vulnerable, they open the door and I told you to stop coming around here. But they allow sin to come in anyway, don't they? And sin sets down. And sin eventually has his way, does he not? And then we're feeling guilty for the next day or two. And then we might live a week. And then sin comes knocking at the door again. Because sin knows that you're weak to him. It's just like a lover that won't disappear. And you know they're good in bed. And you're alone. And it's hard to say no. Because you know how good it's going to be under them sheets. Well, that's the way we play with sin. Whatever the sin is. I don't care if it's anger. I don't care if it's theft. I don't care if it's treachery. If it's pedophilia. If it's homosexuality. If it's fornication. If it's adultery. I don't care if it's cheating in any way, shape, or form. I don't care if it's living holy one day and living like a fool the next. Whatever your pet sin is, guess what? When things go awry in your life, what you have done inadvertently is you have opened the door to the demonic while you're opening the door to sin. When you open your door, if it have you ever opened your door and you smell down the hallway if you live in an apartment complex, you smell down the hall, whoa boy, it stinks down there. What you doing? Oh, that smells rank. And you want to close your door, but some of that stink has made it into your house. Mm -hmm. Well, when you open the door to your lover, which is your sin, your little pet sin, you allow sin to come and sit down on your couch. You may try to close the door real quick, but the demons have followed him in. And they bring a smell. They bring a foul odor. They bring all kind of little demonic powers that work against you. And you don't see them. So you think, well, this is harmless. I'll ask the Lord to forgive me. He understands my needs. He understands my weaknesses. He understands, but he also understands if you really want to live holy and if you really don't want to try. He understands if you're really trying. He understands that. 
He also understands those of you who are really not. So you and God have to determine that for yourselves. When I got to the point where I stopped trying so hard, I got in my car one night after a rendezvous. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm talking about me. Yeah, committing a full-fledged sin. I got in my car after a rendezvous, getting ready to ask the Lord to forgive me, like I always did. And this time, I felt ever so strongly for the first time, the only time in my life, and I hope I never feel that again, I felt the wrath of God. I felt his anger. Scared the boo-boo out of me, y'all. I said, I cannot play with God. Oh, my goodness. See, sometimes his mercy is extended for so long that we start to take it for granted. Well, it's always going to be there for me. But he also says in his word, my spirit will not always strive with you. Keep on playing here. You never know the day you're going to walk right into his wrath. When I sat in the car and I felt his wrath, I said, Lord, I'll do whatever you tell me to do. I'll cut him loose. Lord, please, whatever you do, do not punish me. Please keep me covered. And I broke up with brother man, got it over with. I was like, mm -mm, I ain't going to feel that wrath ever again. That scared me y'all, because I, as much as I love God, as much as I know I'm loved by him, as much as I'm comfortable with him, with all my failures and all my down sittings and weaknesses and imperfections, I also know that fear that fear of God. The same way I was with my parents. When my father looked at me a certain way, huh, unholy terror hit me. And I knew that was my last day on earth. I feared the booty whooping. He only spanked me three times and they were for very serious things. And those serious things were nipped in the bud because he dealt with it when he ne really needed to, the way he needed to. Well, sometimes God will begin to deal with you the way you really need to be dealt with. See, I'd rather feel the wrath and cop a plea, get over it and stop so that I don't have to experience the results of that wrath. But many of you, like I said before, early in the message, because they eliminated corporal punishment and you sit out and have a little time out, you sit in the corner, but they don't do any punishment, no nothing. We have a gener generations of people growing up thinking they do not have to toe the line. They do not have to pay for consequences. They do not have to pay the piper for anything they choose to do wrong. And as a result of that, they don't fear God. They may say they do, but they don't. They fear the boogeyman more than they fear God. They fear the devil more than they fear God. They fear a demon knocking on their door more than they fear God. Because God is merciful. He's kind. He's long suffering. He's patient. But God ain't no flunky and he ain't no fool. So don't play him for one. I was right there on the edge myself. When I felt God's wrath, I said, that's the end of this mess. I do not want to experience his wrath. I felt it. That's bad enough. I do not want to experience it. Do you guys want to experience his wrath? Is, it, is sin worth that to you? to experience God letting fire come out on your behind? Huh? Think about that. I don't know who this is for because I really just started out just teaching a Bible study. But I feel an urgency to tell many of you. And this is not, I'm not just dealing with my little online church. It's only about six or 10 of us. 
No, there's a whole lot of y'all on YouTube listening to this video or who will listen to it. There's a whole lot of people in the body of Christ that don't mean jack. They just want to play with God. They want to pick up God when it's convenient, when they have a need, and when they don't need them, they want to pick up their sin and play with that. And then they wonder why they have no power, why they can't get things done in their lives, why they're always losing battles, why they're always so defeated. If you don't burn and destroy, get rid of, drive out the enemy, if you don't get that sin out of your life, you will always have a, 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 a two-faced life. And you'll always be up one minute, down the next. Happy one minute, mad the next. Glorified one day, sad and depressed the next. The Bible says a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Don't be double-minded in your walk with the Lord. Focus. Stay focused. Discipline yourself to the point where it hurts. See, many of you wonder why you don't experience God. Many experiences of God come through the sacrifice of driving sin out of your life for the sake of God to the point of tears. And when you cried your way through, but you pressed in anyway, God shows up. I said, whoa, oh my God. You never expected it. But God rewards holiness, true holiness. But when the first pressure comes, and you give in on the first, second, or third pressure, and you're used to doing that. But you don't fight through to the point where you're agonizing through it. That may be one of the reasons why you've never experienced God. Think about that. So you have to, that's why you have to go to God, you have to pray to God. You have to examine yourself. Ask God to search your heart. See if there be any wicked way in me. And then acknowledge what God shows you. And run, baby, run in the opposite direction. Turn your back on that mess. Drive it out your life and keep it out to the best of your ability. Yes, we all falter and fail from time to time. But when it becomes a happenstance that happens more than not, there's a problem. That's where you need to really check yourself. Now, now that I've given you that sobering tip, whatever you do, do not give up on God. You must press in. Some things will not come unless you press. Have you ever ironed clothes? And then I'm going to close with this. Have you ever ironed a piece of clothing that was really hard to get the wrinkles out? I mean, this is a stubborn piece of material. You iron it, you got the thing up high. Okay, now you got to turn it all the way up to maximum. You got to pour some distilled water in that bad boy and you got to turn the steam thing on. So the steam is coming out, working with the heat. And sometimes the steam isn't enough. You got to press that button and spray that sucker with some down and out water. You got to drown that baby with the heat to get them, those stubborn wrinkles out, right? Mm-hmm. Sometimes we have to fight and work that hard in order, in order to gain the prize. There are many prizes as you walk with Jesus. Jesus said himself, he who puts his hand to the plow and looks back. When you look back, you're longing after your sins. When you look back, your flesh is pulling at you. Come on. Come on. You can lay that down. Come on. Be with me. Nope. Nope. He says, he who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is not worthy of the kingdom of heaven. Be careful. Be counted worthy. 
if that's what you really want. God bless you. Oh, wait, wait. This just came to me when I said that. Sometimes we really know how to go after what we want or who we want. Some of y'all will go over hill and dale. You will climb over armies and go through all kinds of battles to get to that person that you've been longing for. You've been trying to catch that one for a long time. They playing hard to get, aren't they? But you do whenever you jumping through fiery hoops to get to that one. Because you know that's a good one. Good catch. Well, why aren't you pursuing God like that? I leave you with that note. Why aren't you pursuing holiness like that? Some of you pursue booty a whole lot quicker than you pursue holiness. Some of you pursue your lust a whole lot harder than you pursue holiness. Think about that. Mm. God bless you. Don't hate me. As they say, don't, don't hate the, how do they say, don't hate the player, hate the game, or whatever. Anyway, I'm just a messenger, y'all. <laughs> God bless you.